We're, we're, we're delighted to have Katha Pollitt with us. Um, anyone who has followed her work over the years, whether her award-winning subject to debate column in The Nation uh, or her other essays, not, not to mention her poetry, anyone familiar with her work uh, knows uh, Katha has much to say and expresses it very well. Uh, as her official bio states, Katha, uh, quote, is well known for her wit and her keen sense of both the ridiculous and the sublime. That's a very nice thing to have in one's official bio. Um, this isn't the first time that, that she's uh, been uh, here at, at Politics and Prose. We hosted her uh, twice before uh, for collections of her nation articles, um, a volume called Subject to Debate, like the column in, in 2001. Uh, and Virginity or Death in 2006. Uh, her new book, Pro, Reclaiming Abortion Rights, uh, is not a, a collection of articles like the previous ones. It, uh, this is the first single-themed book that, that she's uh, written. Uh, it's a, it's a full-fledged and quite Im impassioned argument in favor of a woman's right to choose. Uh, and first, at first, actually, I was go going to say a defense of a woman's right to choose, uh, but there's nothing defensive about Katha's position. In fact, she asserts that people shouldn't be defensive or apologetic about abortion. They, they should accept it not only as a moral right, but also as a force for social good. In fact, as she notes, abortion is very much a fact of life these days. By menopause, one in three American women will have terminated at least one pregnancy, uh, yet 40 years after Roe v. Wade, abortions have gotten harder, not easier, to obtain in many states as a result of unyielding efforts by the anti-abortion movement. So Katha's book is especially timely and important and, and should provoke some uh, informed discussion uh, here this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Katha Pollitt. so much, Brad, for that lovely introduction. Um, and, and thank you all for being here on this slightly rainy night. And um, um, it's wonderful to be at this great bookstore. Brad and I were talking about, you know, independent bookstores and the challenge of Amazon. And we all have to love and cherish our independent bookstores and, and uh, buy books from them like I'm going to do, just going home with a whole bunch. Uh, you know, the first question, I'm going to read from the book, but I want to talk a little bit about the book first. The first question that people always ask me when I'm interviewed is, why did you write this book? And I'm thinking, you can't be serious. <laughs> uh, you can't be serious. Uh, I wrote this book because all you have to do is open up the newspaper and see the way things are going, that uh, since... 2010, when the Republicans were so successful, um, there have been 205 new abortion restrictions passed in the states. And um, sorry, there's a fly attacking me. Um, and uh, the even more than the restrictions, the discourse, you can just feel it shifting. You can feel it shifting toward the anti-abortion side of um, language and the greater and greater defensiveness of the pro-choice side. And, and I have to say, I, you know, I, sometimes I was really slow to pick up on this, but I now think that when Planned Parenthood decided um, not to use the word pro-choice anymore when they could do that, um, that that was a mistake. Now they speak of, and I don't know how this works, they speak of Okay, we're not going to say pro-choice. We're going to say I'm walking in your shoe, walking in a, another woman's shoes. So what? I'm the, it's the pro-shoes position. I mean, uh, and 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 not only walking in another shoes, but saying you know, okay, we did a lot of focus groups, and you know, I'm just thinking, would the French Revolution have ever happened if they had done a lot of focus groups first? I mean, is that really the way politics happens? Um, but. Uh, focus groups told them that, um, you know, people don't see abortion in terms of black and white, but it, as shades of gray. Well, okay, but isn't that another way of saying 
there are good abortions that I approve of and there are bad abortions I don't approve of. So we have to get rid of the bad ones and reluctantly allow the good ones. And that's not a way to fight for a right that means that women get to decide for themselves. Um, it can't ever be, um, we'll ban abortions except for the abortions I approve of, which would probably not be very many of them, given how judgmental people are. Um, so anyway, it just did seem to me that the pro-choice movement had become very reactive, always talking about safe, legal, and rare. Why not safe, legal, and available? Abortion is rare in much of the country already. So is that a victory? No, it's a, it's a defeat. Um, and uh, abortion is the most tragic, terrible decision a woman ever makes. Um, it's so difficult. It's so agonizing. And all that I see is the pro-choice side is chasing the framing of the anti-choice side. The anti-choice side says, we have to make abortion really hard to get because women are confused when they're pregnant. And the women who want abortions are confused or coerced. They're at a very highly vulnerable emotional state, and we have to slow down the process and make it very hard for them. So um, then pro-choicers say, no, no, they're, 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 they're not confused. They're struggling. It's very difficult. They know it's just, they, they are moral agents. It's a very hard decision. But I don't think that that's the typical experience. I think the typical experience is a woman finds out she's pregnant and she thinks, I have to take care of this as soon as possible. They know that they are not in a good position to have a baby right now. Um, and sure, some women do struggle. I'm not saying everybody's experience is the same, but I don't think that's a typical experience. But that's the experience we're hearing more and more about because the pro-life side, anti-choice side, is so good at putting its people to the fore while our side because of the stigma of abortion, it's very hard for women to uh, come out and talk about it. Um, so anyway, um, I've been reading the introduction as I go around the country, but um, um, now I think um, it occurred to me, especially since it appeared in The Nation, you probably are, some of you are familiar with it, but also, how often do people get to the end of a nonfiction book? <laughs> I asked myself. <laughs> so <laughs> I thought I'm going to read a little bit from the last chapter. Uh, <laughs> Because what I try to do in the book is to kind of flip the equation. And instead of there's abortion and there's motherhood, to show that abortion is really part of motherhood. It's part of responsible baby having, is to have a baby when you're ready for it. Um, and so, but we, in this country, we, we say, oh, you're pregnant. You have to have a baby, you slut. And then, oh, you had a baby. Well, what's that to me? That's your problem. So this is about that, how we have to reframe motherhood as part of the reframing abortion. So here it is, a little, the little bit from fra reframing motherhood. People think of pregnant women as weak and vulnerable. But when I was pregnant with my daughter, I felt as if I could put my hand in fire and it would only glow. I never felt alone. There were two of us right there. I didn't think of my child as an embryo or a fetus, medical words that belonged in a textbook or an abortion debate. I thought of her first as a funny little sea creature of indeterminate sex, and later, yes, as a baby, even though she was only a baby in my thoughts. Like many couples, her father and I even had a pet name for her, Winky. <laughs> I wasn't a mother yet, but I was preparing to be one long before she was born. Waiting for the amnio test to come back, I spent a lot of time wondering what genetic anomalies, as we are taught to call them because defects sound so judgmental, I could live with. That is, the baby could live with. Blind, fine, deaf, fine. But what about blind and deaf? Down syndrome, fragile X, Turner syndrome. As it turned out, I was lucky. The test showed nothing abnormal, and I did not have to decide. I didn't even know about the most disastrous possibilities, anencephaly, or organs growing outside the body like some strangling vine. Today, if I'd gotten test results like that and lived in a state that bans abortion after 20 weeks, I might have to travel to a distant state. I would be able to afford it, but what about the women who can't? What happens to them now? Do they have to carry their doomed winky until it dies inside them or go through childbirth for the sake of life? We think we value mothers in America, but we don't. We may revere motherhood, the, la the hazy abstraction, the cream of wheat with a halo ideal. 
But a mother is just a kind of woman, after all, and women are trouble and not so valuable. Low-income mothers drag down the country. Why'd they have kids if they couldn't support them? Middle-class mothers are boring frumps. Elite ones are obsessed sanctimommies. Don't they know how annoying they are with their yoga, their cat fights over diapers and breastfeeding, their designer strollers that take up half the sidewalk so that people with important places to go have to take several extra steps? <laughs> Motherhood is interesting to the larger culture to the extent it can be turned into a sexual fantasy, the MILF, or as a way to set women against one another or to make judgments about them, or as a rationale to limit women's ability to do anything else, or as a way to manufacture that debilitating fog of guilt and anxiety that saps so many women's vitality and confidence. But in itself, taking care of children is not of great interest to the world at large. The work of mothers is so unvalued that a judge in Nebraska, previously a lawyer for Operation Rescue, can deny a 16-year-old in foster care the abortion she wants on the grounds that she isn't mature enough to choose abortion. But apparently she is mature enough to go through pregnancy and childbirth and raise a child. Anybody can do that. Aristotle thought a woman was a deformed man. Something had gone wrong in conception. Perhaps the south wind was blowing instead of the more vigorous north. And although we may not believe in women's inferiority consciously anymore, the burden is on the woman if she wishes to participate fully in life, which has been organized around the ideal of the male worker without significant responsibilities at home. The burden is also on her if she has children, voluntarily or not, and if she doesn't have children, because what kind of woman doesn't have children? Also, if she has sex, voluntarily or not. She is the one who has to use contraception and use it right or pay the price for its failure. Are men held up to public scorn for fumbling the condom or not withdrawing in time or for that matter, assuming that his partner has taken care of birth control already? She is the stupid one, the careless one, the one who forgot for two minutes how easily her body could betray her. It is as if a woman lugs her reproductive system around her like a fur coat in July. She can't be expected to move about freely like a normal person in that hot, bulky garment, but she could take it off, couldn't she, if she really wanted to. Under these conditions, the ability to end a pregnancy is deeper than a right. It is basic self-preservation. Maybe there could be a society in which women were legally compelled to bear every child they conceived and yet did not find themselves thereby hampered, impoverished, trapped, chained to a hated partner, consigned to a lesser life. But that society would look nothing like the one abortion opponents want to bring about, which is basically a more retrograde version of our own, with women tied to, for decades to raising children as dependent wives or struggling single mothers. Could there be a society in which having a baby in high school made no difference to a girl's bright future? In which motherhood was such a light role there would no, was no reason not to go along with a random pregnancy? Because, say, children were raised communally, as in the original Israeli kibbutzim. And fear of being legally connected to the wrong man was not a factor because the woman had complete control over whether he stayed in her life and the child's life in which pregnancy outside marriage was regarded so benignly and motherhood was so richly rewarded with scholarships, housing, job opportunities, government subsidies, social prestige, and more, that a woman had nothing to lose and much to gain by bearing an accidental baby. It's all starting to sound like some sort of socialist matriarchy, which isn't at all what abortion opponents have in mind. To them, motherhood is more about hatching a baby, less about what comes after. When the little one comes, you'll love it, and everything will work out. Meanwhile, here are some secondhand baby clothes. The trouble with this view is not just that a woman can't return to the Prices Pregnancy Center and get help with groceries for her five-year-old or go back to medical school when her baby starts kindergarten. It's that it presents having a child as no big deal. Any woman can do it, even a 12-year-old, and just get on with her life or give the baby up. Once she gives birth, her job is practically done. This cavalier art attitude about childbearing and childrearing is an exaggerated version of the way motherhood is valued or undervalued by society generally. The whole world turns on women's unpaid or grossly underpaid labor, and it always has. When that work is an extension of female domestic roles, caring for children or the elderly, preparing food, cleaning houses, it is ill-paid, 
insecure, low skilled, and low status. But when it is done within the family, it is so deeply mystified and romanticized, so wrapped in religion, morality, tradition, and ideas about what's natural, that it looks like something else, a free gift of love, a personal preference, a private arrangement that stands outside the marketplace and cannot be judged by outsiders. And yet, if women rejected labor within the family, society would have to pay enormous sums to replace it. At least elder care is generally recognized to be a personal sacrifice. Some states will even pay relatives a small sum through Medicaid to keep an elderly person out of, out of a nursing home. The social value of motherhood is much more hidden. In fact, it is so obscured that in 2009, Senator John Kyle, Republican of Arizona, tried to strike pregnancy and childbirth from the list of conditions employers had to include in their health plans under the Affordable Care Act. I don't need maternity care, he argued. I think your mom probably did, Senator Debbie Stabenow tartly <laughs> replied. But he continued, so requiring that on my insurance policy is something that I don't need and will make my policy more expensive. The Harvard economist Greg Mankiw also objects to the community rating of maternity care. The goal is to spread the risk of childbirth among the larger community, he wrote on his blog. But having children is more a choice than a random act of nature. People who drive a new Porsche pay more for car insurance than those who drive an old Chevy. We consider this fair, because which car you drive is a choice. Why isn't having children viewed in the same way? Leaving aside the fact that not all childbearing is so voluntary, is a baby like a luxury car? The social value of Porsches is very low. If nobody bought them, or yachts, or diamond-encrusted Rolexes, or Jackson Pollocks, the world would go on much the same. But children are immensely important to everyone, including people who don't have any or want any. They have value both as the children they are, giving meaning and purpose and joy, not just to their parents, but grandparents, aunts, uncles, family friends, to say nothing of empl providing employment for millions of teachers, caregivers, pediatricians, nurses, toy makers, and so on, and also as the adults they become. They are the future, after all. If women stopped having babies, the human race would end. And Mankiw would have no students in his EC 101 class. And if women stopped raising babies to adulthood, usually quite competently, despite the cost to themselves, and without anything remotely like enough support from the community whose costs Mankiw is so worried about, who would do that work? Mankiw trivializes motherhood as a socially useless individual choice. Abortion opponents, who glorify motherhood in the abstract, trivialize it more subtly by making it a question of no choice, of one-size-fits-all one biological fate. They deny its physical risks, its social and economic costs, and its enormous personal consequences. They disregard the individual circumstances and inner life of the pregnant woman. They equate the value of a grown woman with that of a zygote. They entwine childbearing with the very different issues of chastity and sexual continence. And they use the threat of pregnancy to enforce their own repressive so sexual mores. But whether a baby is a free personal choice, or what you get for being a slut, or God's beautiful gift to rape victims, the practical result is the same. Whatever difficulties motherhood entails are the problem of individual mothers. What if we respected pregnancy and childbirth as major physical, psychological, and economic events, as work? There's a reason they call childbirth labor. Making a healthy baby takes effort. It requires foresight and self-denial and courage. It's expensive and demanding and tiring. You have to learn new things, change many habits, possibly deal with complicated medical situations, make difficult decisions, and undergo stressful ordeals. I had a wisdom tooth pulled without Novocaine when I was pregnant. It hurt a lot and seemed to go on forever. The kindness of the very young dental assistant holding back my hair as I spat blood into a bowl will stay with me for the rest of my life. Pregnant women do such things and much harder things all the time. For example, they give birth, which is somewhere on the scale between painful and excruciating. Or they have a cesarean, as I did, which is major surgery. None of this is without risk of death or damage or trauma, including psychological trauma. To force girls and women to undergo this against their will is to annihilate their humanity. When they undertake it by choice, we should all be grateful. 
that there is no way to equalize men's contribution to reproduction is all the more reason to honor women for volunteering to go through it on their behalf. The world must be peopled, Benedict says, in Much Ado About Nothing. But the only time we recognize the social value of childbearing is when we are blaming middle-class white women for not doing enough of it. To a far greater degree than most other Western nations, we have decided that women should individually bear most of the consequences of becoming a parent. The sexual puritanism of conservative Christianity meets the conservative libertarianism of Greg Mankiw. Why should I pay for your birth control or your abortion or your baby? Get a husband. The results are all around us in the highest rates by far of teen pregnancy and teen childbearing in the West, struggling single mothers, downwardly mobile families, child poverty. That this is degrading to women is obvious, but it is also degrading to motherhood. It turns what should be a source of strength and power and recognition into something that renders women weak and dependent, blocks them from full participation in life, undermines their economic standing, and leaves too many poor in old age, if not before. Perhaps that is the point. When you consider the way restrictions on abortion go hand in hand with cutbacks in social programs and stymied gender equality, it is hard not to suspect that the aim is to put women and children back under male control by making it impossible for them to sur survive outside it. Thank you. So. So that was pretty fiery. Uh, so I, I'd be happy to, you know, take questions. You, you can sound off, whatever, whatever you like. There's the microphone over there. Hi, it's so nice oh, to meet over there you too. finally. Oh, it's nice to meet you too. Um, for years, I have read your column to a friend. Who, who couldn't read himself anymore, and so that is how I met you initially. Oh. And now hearing your interview on the radio on Democracy Now! with... Uh, Amy Goodman. With Amy Goodman about uh, this book, I'm so pleased that you are addressing this subject so forcefully and so positively, rather than on the defensive. Well, thank so you. So I'm really, really pleased, and just your, what you read was what I read in your book, which was that last chapter. Uh -huh. Oh, good, good. So, <laughs> well, very, There's always the middle, too. Very, Don't forget it's that. Very, <laughs> it's very helpful. And one thing I was looking for as I was thinking of what I was going to say, and I can talk very long on, on various thoughts I have but won't, was I think the official federal uh, estimate or, or calculation of what it costs to raise a child for 2013 was 247 Unbelievable 000. amounts of money. Yeah, it's very expensive. Up to age 18. Right. Yeah. Without, without college, without private school, without, and I don't know what goes in the calculation, but I assume the feeding and health care and what have you. Yeah. So I agree with you that uh, from people that I know, it was an easy decision to whether to have an abortion or not. And well, you know, it, uh, speaking of the cost of raising children, which is, of course, all worth it, um, but uh, um, uh, there's a section in the book that discusses something that interests me greatly, which is the whole um, uh, pronatalist movement. Uh, is, I wouldn't call it a movement, the whole pronatalist um, um, writing of conservative writers trying to get middle-class white women to have more children. Um, and um, the thing they never say, the thing, they, the thing because they're conservative, the thing they must debunk is the idea that if, if it was made easier for people to have children, more people would be willing to do it. Um, so it always has to be, no, no, that's not going to make any difference. Look at, uh, you look at Europe. They do everything for children over there, mothers and children over there, and the birth rate's very low. So it would be the same over here. No, so we don't, we don't want to do that. We'll raise taxes. Very bad, very bad. Um, but the fact is, if... If it would be even worse if those countries, which don't all do all that much for families, it would be even worse. And p countries like Sweden and France have succeeded in marginally raising their birth rate by doing a lot for families in a context of, and this is very important, of gender, of increasing gender equality. 
Um, because if you do a lot for families like Germany does, but in a way that takes, makes it very hard for women to continue in their, uh, their work lives once they have children, then a lot of women decide not to have children at all. Um, and that's what happens in Germany, where um, the birth rate is very low because a lot of women just say, no, I'm not going to do this because it means, it means I have to be a housewife. I don't want to be a housewife. So uh, there are ways and ways of doing these things. But what's interesting to me is that the, uh, the pronatalist argument always is about middle class white women, but they can't quite say that. Um, because actually, what about, because they'll, they'll say, oh, we need more people working. I'll say, what about the, all the people who aren't working now? You know, what about all the people we throw away, all the poor kids, you know, who grow up with no skills and they can barely read and write? And we just are, we're, we have very little problem saying, well, we're not just going to count you. Um, so it's really, it really is very racist, the way it's formulated. Um, and uh, it's amusing to read these articles like um, by... Um, Jonathan Last wrote a whole book about this. It's very amusing to watch them make these arguments without ever having to sort of bring race officially into it, but it's really all over it, as it always has been. It always has been. Those arguments are always nationalistic and uh, racist and sexist, sorry to say. I have so, a question. Yeah. Um, there's been a lot of literature lately about um, protracted death and the sort of right to die and sort of die peacefully and thinking about that. Where do you think, if you do, think that plays into this sort of argument um, about pro-choice and about abortion? Um, the sort of this right to die and the right to sort of not have a protracted death? Well, there are ways in which they're related, but there are ways in which they're different. Um, because there is a piece of the uh, abortion argument that is about a woman's right to control what goes on in her body. Um, and you could say that there is that piece of it in the right to die thing, but it's not quite the same because the woman is trying to survive and the dead, the dying person is trying to die. You know, I mean, they just do seem kind of different um, to me. But um, uh, and I, li I like to think about them in different terms. Um, I think um, the right to die thing is something we all think about a lot as we go older. But I know people who have killed themselves and really destroyed large numbers of people emotionally. Um, so I wouldn't want to say, you know, oh, yeah, sure, kill yourself if you want to. So, yeah. Hi, I just want to say thank you for writing this book and oh. for standing up to what amounts to patriarchal backlash. I mean, that's really I do use that word. I think that's what we're all talking about. And I, um, I totally hope your book sells like crazy. I hope more and more people write in the same manner that you're writing now. I hope that the airwaves display this side of the question of pro-choice and um, I wish you all the best in keeping on with your voice and um, fighting against this sort of wave of patriarchal control over women's choices in all all forms of life well, not just pregnancy well thank you for saying that you know if I could just say a little bit about patriarchy um which is not a fashionable word, um, but I think it is an accurate word in certain ways for certain elements of this, the whole abortion situation. Okay, where is the base of the anti-abortion movement? Um, there are, you know, you don't have to be religious. Um, you, you can be a feminist, you can sort of, you can be against abortion, but those people, like there's gay pro-lifers, there's f feminists for life, but the functional base of the anti-abortion movement is in the patriarchal churches. It just is, that's just a fact. The Catholic Church is a patriarchal institution. Women have no, they can't be priests. They have no institutional power. They're not even supposed to use birth control. Um, and the Southern Baptists have, as a dogma, they probably, I don't know that they use the term dogma, but as an official thing you have to believe, uh, wifely submission. 
A woman has to submit to her husband. That's patriarchy. That just is what it is. They don't make any bones about it. They never, don't say women are equal, but they say no, they're not. <laughs> uh, and and you know those the evangelical fundamentalist conservative Protestant churches and the Catholic Church together is where the money is. It's where the the moxie and the energy is. It's where the org the places where they're logical for, you know, where people gather. When I go to the Right to Life march around the anniversary of Roe v. Wade um, every year, well, I don't know, I'll go this year. I went for the last two years. And, you know, I give these people credit. The weather is always horrible, you know, and it's, it's this horrible rainy snow, and it's so, it's so cold that I can hardly write my notes out. And they're marching, so good for them. But um, the fact is, 95% of the people there are religious Catholics. Um, there are not the gays for pro-life there. It's, it's an organized movement. And um, it's allied itself, or the Republicans have allied itself to them, the Republican Party, and now they have a natural home in the two-party system. They control one party on this issue. And um, it's really kind of a coming together of these three um, bad things. <laughs> um, so I, th and, and the, the people that are against abortion rights, it's not like they're saying, oh yes, I'm for everything else on the feminist agenda except for that. Politically, they're against everything else too. They're against equal pay, they're against the Violence Against Women Act, they're, I mean, you name it, they're against it. And one thing I did in my book, as I discuss, there is a complete correlation between the states where the status of women is lowest and the states with the most restrictions on abortion. Um, it, you can just go down the list and uh, where, where you find women make the least with respect uh, relation to men's wages, the fewest women in state legislatures, the least health care for women and children. Those are the states where the anti-abortion movement has been particularly successful. So it kind of makes a picture. Um, and uh, I think the picture that it makes is, you know, deserves the name of patriarchy. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. Sorry. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Uh, Planned Parenthood has been certainly at the forefront of women's rights, uh, reproductive rights, uh, for some time. And we all recognize them as sort of the uh, standard bearer for a uh, woman's right to choose. Uh, however, we have a little anecdotal evidence that Planned Parenthood may be struggling in some ways, including funding and, and perhaps a loss of political clout in some areas. Uh, a two-part question. Number one, are there other organizations such as Planned Parenthood who uh, have also taken up uh, the cause in a, in a sort of a high-profile way as they have? Uh, and number two is, what do you see as the future of the struggle for uh, women's reproductive rights, uh, in both in a social justice way and in a political way? Um, okay, well, the first part I'm uh, maybe not going to give the best informed answer to, but um, Planned Parenthood is basically a medical organization. Um, it, it basically gives, provides medical care. Um, so its political role is kind of a slightly different thing. Um, and uh, I'm not aware that they are struggling. Are they struggling, Fran? Tell me. No, I don't think they are struggling. They're just opening, uh, they're opening some new Planned Parenthood clinics. Uh, for example, they're opening one in Texas um, and, um, and in other places as well. So I'm not sure that they're in, in, in the kind of trouble you're talking about. Um, but, and I think, in fact, because they are such a major, have become such a major health provider, they're super careful about their messaging in a way that another, you know, more frankly, uh, more, uh, not, not frankly, but um, more limited to politics doesn't have to quite be. Um, you know, NARAL has a new leader, Elise Hogue, who is a community, uh, an activist, uh, longstanding, um, and she's young despite her longstanding. Uh, so that's really, I think she's really great. And I think NARAL is showing uh, more life than it has in a while. Um, and then there are abortion funds that I want to, always want to tell people about. Um, and there is one right here in Washington, D.C., called the D.C. Abortion Fund, DCAF. And you can go online and find it. And you can 
uh, make a donation and help um, help a help a sister out. You know, help a woman who needs help funding her abortion because, as you all know, despite uh, the city council and the mayor wanting to have Medicaid abort, uh, pay for poor women's abortions, the uh, Congress and Senate won't allow that to happen here. So, um, so that's something. But you know, I feel that there's kind of a turning around. You know, I think things have been very depressed for a long time. But this youngest generation of activists are really fantastic, and they're much more creative, in your face, unapologetic, um, and they're thinking about things like how can we get people talking about this in a different way, um, like an organization called Sea Change. Um, is is really you know I have hope there because they're try really trying to do be more grassroots get more people talking uh, more women talking about their experiences um, which is so important so I'm I think you know sometimes things get so bad that people wake up so let's hope that that's what's happening instead of things get so bad and then people just feel like they've been hit over the head um, so well, that was a good question yeah. Right, right. Uh, so there's another organization called the Abortion Care Network, which is a national organization of independent abortion providers. And they provide mostly abortions in the country. Planned Parenthood provides some, but uh, my organization and the providers in it, they're the ones that you're hearing about all the time in all the states. So if you're also looking for another place to donate money, the Abortion Care Network is a really great place. So please look online. It's just abortioncarenetwork.org. Great, thanks a lot. I wanted to jump on that real quick too. Sorry, I also work at the National Abortion Federation based here in DC, um, and we have a national hotline that does funding similar to DCAF, the DC Abortion Fund, and we work with you as well. Um, um, but there are like other big national organizations that are kind of in the background behind Planned Parenthood, um, but they are there taking up the torch um, and, and still carrying on the work. So regardless of whatever happens with Planned Parenthood as a medical organization, the movement is still gonna keep going. So Batman is on our side. <laughs> bat, bat, girl. bat, <laughs> bat girl is on our side. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So this is kind of a question about a particular thing I've been noticing that I'm wondering if the pro-life, pro-choice movement has addressed ever, which is the cost of abortions. Because recently I was on the Plan Planned Parenthood website because one of my friends had like a pregnancy scare. And we noticed that abortions were like several hundred dollars. And this is a friend with very religious parents who would not have been willing to fund that. And like she, you know, couldn't pay for it herself. None of us could because we're 16. We're not employed. And I was wondering if that's something that has been addressed. The fact that Planned Parenthood abortions are supposed to be like this safe, healthy thing, but they're not something that many people can access, particularly like unemployed teenagers who are often the people who yeah. need them the most. Well, you should, your friend should call DCAF, well, should call the abortion fund. It's and no also, longer a problem. Also, oh, okay. Uh, um, also, <laughs> there, there, <laughs> Planned Parenthood does um, help some poor women out. Um, it has, it has some, uh, some funding for that. Um, so uh, the sticker price might not be the real price in every case. Okay. Um, and it's really worth checking that out um, carefully. But no, I mean, it's, you know, the people, the, the anti-choice side, if you read them, like Jill Stanek, to her, the only reason anyone has an abortion is so that abortion clinics can make money. That's what it's all about. It doesn't explain, like, why does she go there to help them make money? <laughs> that part is, uh, well, she's confused. But... Um, um, and they obsess about uh, profit in the abortion care business, which they never obsess about in any other area of medicine. It's really expensive to have a baby, too. Um, most medical care is quite expensive. Going to the dentist is expensive. Um, and it actually, abortions are, uh, they have not increased over the years of their being legal, anything like they would increase it just from, infla from inflation and all like that. Because, I mean, I remember my mother used to give her friends money for an illegal abortion, and it was $500. And that's what an abortion costs, the first tr trimester abortion costs now. So, um, and this is many years later with when you can, you know, used to be able to go 
At that time, you could buy a bag full of groceries for $10. So um, anyway, there is help out there. And if anyone is, is, in, is in trouble like your friend, they should not just assume they can't afford their abortion. Yeah. Hi. Um, Kath, I really appreciated you reading from the section of your book on reframing motherhood, and I would love to hear your thoughts um, in the ways that, um, uh, whether it's from the pro-choice or anti-choice movement, sort of culturally, we talk about our imperfect mothers and then see this come through in policy. I'm thinking of laws recently passed in Tennessee, for example, that criminalize drug use yeah. while pregnancy that is actually not a criminal offense anywhere else. Um, you know, <laughs> and to the ex and just to the extent that or I guess how that plays into this task, which I agree completely that we have ahead of us, which is reframing and um, re-understanding what motherhood is and the idea that there are value judgments that we have put there and what that means going forward. Yes, and value judgments, but not help. That's the other piece of it. Um, now we're seeing hundreds of women are in jail uh, awaiting trial for drug use illegal drug use during pregnancy. And, you know, some if they deliver a stillborn baby or a baby that tests positive, they are uh, in a world of trouble. There was a woman, a 16-year-old in Mississippi, you know, for de accused of depraved heart murder because she delivered a stillborn baby. And they said it was because of drugs. And uh, there are women who have been Another thing that happens is women are sentenced to longer, pregnant women who commit a crime, X, whatever crime it is, get longer sentences um, because they're pregnant when they committed the crime. Um, and and uh, I was, uh, you know, I wrote a lot about one case that I found particularly heartbreaking, which was that of Bebe Shuai in Indiana. So Bebe Shuai was a, an, a Chinese immigrant woman, and um, she was pregnant with a wanted child. And her boyfriend tells her in the parking lot when she is, you know, n very pregnant, um, that actually he's married and he was leaving her to go back to his wife. Very nice. So she tries to commit suicide. I mean, she, she, she took um, rat poison. Um, and she survived. Her, the baby was born and it died after birth. Um, so she was charged both with um, attempted murder of a fetus and, hom you know, homicide. This case took years to resolve. This was in Indiana. This poor woman, there was no pity for her. It was all, you tried to kill your baby. Well, what about what was going on with her? What about that guy, you know? I mean, doesn't he have any responsibility to just walk out on this nine months pregnant woman like that in a parking lot? Um, so, I mean, it's just so heartless, and I think we're moving, cl you know, because, because of a lot of things, because we're so down on drugs, because we hate women, because now we have all this medical technology um, that allows us to supposedly test for all kinds of things, that we're really saying to women, pregnant women, you have a legal duty to give birth to a healthy baby, and if you don't do that, and we can find that this baby problem is in any way connected to your behavior. You know, God help you. It's so terrible because it doesn't go along with any help. You know, these, all these, sta these states that are passing laws that about drug use during pregnancy, it's not like they have um, drug help <laughs> during pregnancy. Most uh, drug rehabilitation places don't take women with children. And most women who are pregnant already have, a, you know, who are, are in this position, they already have a child. So it's really, it's like all blame, no help. It's very, very wrong and cruel. Yeah. Hi. 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 Um, could you discuss a little bit uh, your very explicit move back to, like, the language of choice against, uh -huh. say, being in favor of, abortion rights or reproductive rights, because that was a, a kind of a controversy uh -huh. that came up several years ago that choice itself was kind of, a, kind of a soft libertarianism. It wasn't specific to the issue. It seemed kind of vague. It got, you know, kind of mocked on um, sex in the city, like I choose my choice, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, so w what's your thinking in terms of the rhetoric of the polemic use of choice? 
Good question. By the way, that's Rich Yeselson, who was so helpful to me when I was writing my book. He's so, so if you don't, there's something you don't like, you just blame him. Uh, I took all his, I took most of your suggestions. Uh, uh, <laughs> oh, it was really fun. It was really fun. Um, but uh, um, that's a really great question. Um, you know, choice became a big word. Uh, as uh, Will Salatan describes in his very interesting book, uh, Bearing Right, how, um, how conservatives won the abortion war, something, something like that. Um, and uh, he discussed how uh, abortion rights took a libertarian turn when it was on the verge of being lost in Virginia. And the, the states were passing very, it was going to pass a very strict law. And it was discovered through, again, you know, focus grouping and all like that, that um, a successful way to sell abortion rights to the general public was the um, keep the government, government's hands off. This is just my decision, leave me alone. Uh, the libertarian framing. And that's sort of where choice came in, uh, as opposed to. I mean, if you say pro-rights, see, the thing is everybody knows choice means abortion. That's why that there could be that joke in sex and see, which pro-rights, that could mean anything. Um, uh, and I think that, you know, I, I like the reproductive justice framing. I think that that is uh, very good, and, and I'll explain what that is, which is the new, it's not new, but it comes out of black feminism from the 90s, um, that, you know, it's, choice sort of ends once you're born. <laughs> It's really about what, what you decide to do with a pregnancy. But reproductive justice puts the whole thing in a much bigger social, economic, racial, everything framework, which is you should be able to have a baby, you should be able to have a baby too, and you should be able to raise that baby well. And uh, we need to do more for families, for mothers, to make sure that kids can grow up healthy, to make sure that mothers aren't sidelined by having a baby in the ways that I was describing. Um, so I totally support that. The only problem is, okay, so pro-life, it's one syllable. Reproductive justice is a lot of syllables. Pro-reproductive justice, it, it just doesn't, um, uh, it's too long. <laughs> so we need to think of, as I've been <laughs> giving this talk, I think around the country, I think we need to have a contest for the one syllable. You know, if you don't like choice, what's your one-syllable answer? Maybe a two-syllable answer. Um, because it does need to be, be something that people can relate to quickly. Um, and I think that choice is the best we've come up with so far. Um, and I, am, I think it has a history. Um, and history is really important. And once you start talking about, you know, shoes and black and white and gray, you've just lost that history. You've just opened up for confusion, the things we've spent 40 years defining. So that's as far as I can get on the whole framing of the word thing. So thank you for that great question. Hi. Anyone? Uh, yeah. My question kind of piggybacks off that. I like that your use of choice. Uh, my concern is I've read, I support like everything that you've said tonight, but I've read a lot of articles about your book in the past couple of weeks, and my concern is the abortion as a social good and the political messaging of that. And I agree that it's a good, it's good to have access, and there's no choice without access and all of these things. But in the effort that, or in the in the understanding that pro-life is a strong political message, and that we, as the pro-choice movement, have been losing, we lost partial birth abortion we lose often on parental notification because these things just sound good. Mm -hmm. They sound commonsensical. And my fear is that when we, I of course don't think abortion should be stigmatized. I agree with what you were saying that abortion is, is not that difficult of a choice for many women depending on their position or situation. But that politically that's not good and politically abortion on demand is not a winning strategy. I personally I don't think and so I'm wondering what how do we take what your message is that choice is a part of motherhood which I like that too pro-choice pro-motherhood but I'm concerned that abortion as a social good is not a winning 
Well, it's a little, it. it's a, it, you know, it's a stretch for some people. Yes, I agree with that. Um, we're so used to thinking of it as this bad thing that um, bad people do instead of as something people do to have a rational life that people, you know, W most women who have a, I, I mean, I'm, I can't answer your question. I can't do the, you know, the PR framing of all this. It's just not my thing. But um, so someone else, maybe here in the audience, will have to do that. Um, but you know, if keep in mind, 61 percent of women who have abortions are already mothers, and that I think that is something that's very hard for the anti-abortion people to to deal with because their thing is she doesn't know what she's doing and she needs to see an ultrasound and she needs to have a waiting period um, as if she's never been pregnant but she has been pregnant she's given birth she's taking care of children um, and uh, that lets you see it as this is part of the whole uh, spectrum of reproductive things that happen in women's lives they have children and they have abortions. It's the same person. Whereas the, um, the anti-abortion framing is there are women who are mothers and there are women who have abortions. And the women who have abortions are either sluts or confused or they hate children. There's something just terribly wrong with them. But it's the same person. Um, and I think we just need to say that more openly. Um, and you know, you're not going to persuade everybody. If somebody believes that an unimplanted fertilized egg is a baby, that is a religious conviction, that it's, it's a metaphysical thing. And you're not going to win those people um, any more than you're going to you know, convert them to Judaism or Islam or <laughs> communism <laughs> or something. That's just what they think. But th th so you don't ha you're not going to win those people, but you'll, you'll, you'll get other people to see abortion as more of a sort of a, a normal event. When one in three women are doing something, you can't say that it's not a normal thing. It is, I mean, just by the meaning of the word normal, it is normal. Um, so that's as far as I can go on the framing. Yeah. Well, okay, one, one more question. Sure. Um, hi, so I'm one of a couple people in this room that actually took part in a fabulous conversation today talking about disability rights and reproductive rights. And in this uh, atmosphere where people are not talking about abortion as a social good and a good thing, um, like you do in your book, oftentimes people go to the exceptions and they try to focus on, well, a, wooden, a woman wouldn't possibly want to have to have a baby that might have a disability. And, um, and how do we walk back from there and that frame of really just focusing on things like disability, on rape, on incest, on the exceptions, when that's the frame that we're in now, how do we as people who want to turn to good, how yeah. do we bring that frame forward? That's a really good question because that's what I, I feel the, where the pro-choice movement, for completely understandable reasons, took the wrong turn because they always talk about the rape victim, the incest victim, the woman who's going to die, the baby that has the cat catastrophic, you know, uh, fatal anomalies that I mentioned when I read. Um, but most abortions, 90% of abortions, are not for any of those reasons. Those happen to be the reasons most Americans will say, okay, you can have your abortion. When you get into the reasons people really have abortions, like they are poor. <laughs> They have all the children they can handle. They don't want to be a single mother. You'd think people would praise them for that. We're so down on single mothers. Um, they want to finish school. They want to keep their job. They're, to, they're not ready to have a baby. Those reasons people, you know, tell pollsters at least they're not so sympathetic to. And when it's their daughter, they probably are sympathetic to it. But when th what they tell pollsters is they're not. Um, and I think we need to normal. We need to talk about these real life situations. Um, because otherwise we'll end up in a situation where there'll be, uh, well, there'll be laws that say, okay, if you can prove you've been raped, then you can have your abortion. If you can prove you're going to die, you know, you can have your abortion. Um, but everything else, forget it. Um, and we don't want that. We don't want that at all. So we have to, I think, you know, I think it would be really great if women could talk more about their own experiences. I think that's what feminism is. Feminism is about sharing your experiences and seeing that the the way the world sees things is not the way it really is for women. 
Um, and I'll just close with one story. When I was in um, Minnesota, a woman came up to me after I had read, and she said, um, I had an abortion. This is a middle-aged woman. She says, I had an abortion, and I've never told anyone, even my best friend. And I said, well, what do you think would happen if you told your best friend? And she said, I think she'd tell me she had an abortion, too. So I'll just let that sit there. <laughs> and thank you all so much for coming. It's really great. <laughs>